thank you all for coming. Um, we've got a really uh, great group of panelists. Um, I've got just a quick intro on innovation. So it's now, and it's kind of fitting that we're talking about this a couple days after the midterm elections. Every government wants to, um, to, to claim innovation. They want innovation to be the driver for prosperity, for jobs, uh, for the creation of, of new industries. Uh, President Obama in his State of the Union address this year said, we know that the nation that goes all in on innovation today will own the global economy tomorrow. Not to be outdone at this year's uh, European Innovation Convention, the Commission's president, European Commission president, Jose Manuel Barroso, stated that innovation is not just a policy for one commissioner or one director general. It is something that has to be a mainstream policy. And all the way on the other side of the world, in Japan, we have uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe recently launched his third arrow of economic reforms, which includes tax policies that are designed to spur corporate investment and innovation. But we all know that innovation is not something you can just magically induce from a corporate R&D park, the laboratories of an academic institution, except maybe Berkeley. Maybe. Of course. Um, Go Bears. Go Bears. Uh, or, or a government patent office or something. So um, Silicon Valley, where we find ourselves this evening, uh, is perhaps the greatest testament to this. Um, it is the envy of the world for the extraordinary legacies it has created and continues to spawn. Think of the uh, creations hatched a few towns away by Bill Hewlett and, and uh, Dave Packard in the 50s, the company that Steve Jobs um, created um, and then went back and recreated, um, or even the uh, dorm room epiphany known as Facebook, um, which is an incredible engine of growth and innovation. Anyway, these are reminders that innovation is open to everyone, can happen anywhere, and follows no preordained path. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the ingredients that, 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 that foster and create innovation. Please welcome my killer panel to tackle these questions. I have Dr. Peter Lee all the way on the end here. He's the head of Microsoft Research. Thank you, doctor. Dr. Michael Karasik, vice president of innovations at the IBM Watson Group. Uh, Tom Riley is the CEO of Cloudera. Professor Annalee Saxenian, the dean of the School of Information at the University of California, Berkeley. And Jeff Clavier, founder and managing partner of SoftTech Venture Capital. Um, I'm going to ask you guys first a question you can all answer. Well, why are you here? What got you interested in whatever it is that, we're, that, that, that now makes you uh, qualified and interested to talk about this concept of innovation? I'm going to go left to right to left, or wait, stage right to left. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, by the way, I'm so glad I didn't wear a tie. I thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, um, well, I, I I'm Asian. I grew up in an Asian household. I had a uh, dad who was a physics professor, mom, chemistry professor. So what do you think would happen? So you had no choice is what you're saying? <laughs> well, you know, I think I was destined for a life of science and actually physical sciences. And it was actually a disappointment to my parents when I decided to study computer science. <laughs> that was just a tool for the real intellectual pursuits. Um, but I think the thing that really made an impact in getting me away from technology, uh, science into technology, was as a nine-year-old kid watching the moon landing. And I was just one of those kids who ate space food sticks and drank Tang, <laughs> you know what that is, uh, every day during that whole period. And the idea that you could actually make things and spin off technologies like Velcro uh, was just incredibly formative for me. I, I think it's why I'm here now. All right. I've actually been pretty lucky. I, I always tell people I got into computing in a, both a traditional and a non-traditional way. I started very early, before it was cool. Um, I was uh, making a telescope, as you know, teenagers do. And it was a design called the Schiefspiegler that I guarantee nobody in the audience has ever heard of. And it turned out that in order to figure out the um, curvatures, which were spherical of the mirrors, you needed to do a lot of math. So I, I asked somebody back in high school, I won't tell you what year it was, but it was a card reader uh, to teach me how to write a computer program. And uh, after about six months, I completely forgot about the telescope. Um, that's how I got into computing. As to why I'm here, it's been an interesting um, sort of a random walk through technology of various kinds. Uh, I started as a researcher. Um, I gave up decimal points. I used to do geometric modeling and robotics. I gave up decimal points after a few years. Um, and uh, 
I found that um, more than doing individual uh, research, which was fun, I really found I enjoyed helping people think through things, think through problems. And uh, you know, one thing led to another, and uh, here I am. Tom? Well, um, so I grew up right around here in Silicon Valley. Um, and I think a turning point for me, a lot of my friends' dads were executives in, in the late 70s, which were the innovative companies. And I'm thinking of one story where uh, one of my friends' dads was a senior vice president at Fairchild Semiconductor. And one day in the garage, we found a box full of these little electronic gizmos. And there were digital stopwatches. And his dad was going to throw them away because it was a project that failed. The notion of a digital stopwatch. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, my friend, his name was Greg, actually Greg Reyes. He went on to run Brocade. Um, he uh, pulled one open, doing a little soldering, and got these things to work. And so we spent a weekend fixing about 500 of these. But I was the one that said, we could sell these for $5. <laughs> and, uh, the business guy. <laughs> and so what I learned is I am actually not an innovator. Uh, I've never innovated anything. But what I built a career around is how to build businesses around innovation, how to create cultures that foster innovation. Uh, and I hope that's why I'm here. So I grew up in a small town in the Northeast in Massachusetts called Concord, Massachusetts. Um, I think we heard about something. Something that happened there a long time ago. And we, I was you know, proud to be living on near Route 128, America's technology highway. All of my um, parents' friends and you know, the, the people in my neighborhood all taught at MIT. They were engineers. They were um, computer scientists, early computer scientists. And I thought I was in the center of the technology universe. And then I came to graduate school at Berkeley in the late 1970s, and I started doing research for a master's thesis. Uh, and I, San Jose at that time in the late 70s was the fastest growing urban area in the country. And I said, OK, I want to learn why. Why is this place growing so fast? And I started to interview these executives, the guys at Fairchild, at Intel, at some of the startups at the time. And I realized that this place here was very different from the place I had grown up. Um, I, I, I did make a mistake and predict that Silicon Valley would stop growing because it was too crowded and too expensive and traffic was too congested. But uh, I, it sort of set me on a, an academic career to understand what made Silicon Valley so different, even from the place on the East Coast that was the most like it, that had a university and um, all of the elements. So that's what brought me here. And I think what brought me here is my connection to um, Thomson Reuters. So um, I was born, educated um, in France. And in France at the time, we're looking at eight, 1985, if you're successful, you go through a great engineering school and you join a large company because the notion of creating a startup means that you can't find a job anywhere else. And um, when I told my parents, and I was a you know, pretty good student, and when I told my parents that I was going to do a startup <clears throat> in the financial services market, they said, but we don't understand. You've always had good grades. <laughs> and so we did a, a, a startup. We brought uh, Sun workstations and trading floors in the late 80s. And at the time, it was really cool. Um, and we were acquired by Reuters in 1993. And I was the CTO, so I stayed uh, for a number of years. I went through the, uh, the Euro transition, the millennium, uh, putting in place the 35-hour week in France, which disgusted me from doing anything in France ever again. Um, and by accident, um, I ended up here as the, um, the, one of the partners of the Reuters Greenhouse Fund, which was the corporate venture arm of Reuters. And so I got to witness the crash of the bubble in 2000 and how nonsensical some of the business plans that my fellow VCs were funding, giving entrepreneurs you know, five to $10 million where there was no technology, no marketing, no nothing. But that was the way sort of startups were built back in 2000. And when in 2003, 2004, I saw the emergence of this next generation of uh, consumer internet companies showing up with uh, brand new user interfaces and experiences and a need for just two to three thousand dollars to just you know 
um, two to three hundred thousand dollars to get started, there was no one in the ecosystem to actually fund them. So I decided to go do that. So I started Softech and was one of the first, uh, what they called at the time, super angels, and then uh, raised one of the first micro VC funds ten years ago. And and now uh, we're basically funding about you know. 15 to 20 companies a year out of the several thousand that we see, and it's in a number of sort of different sectors. So we're not, we've innovated on the business model of uh, venture capital, and we're helping innovators by giving them quite a bit of money and a lot of advice. Great, okay, that's good. We now understand where you guys are coming from. Let's, let's address the sort of major question, which is how do you actually foster innovation? And I wanna sort of pose it in a slightly different way, which is we've got people from all sorts of different backgrounds, but you know how do, how is it? Let's talk. Let's start big companies. We've got Microsoft and IBM here, um, and Cloudera, which one day will be a big company. I know based on, on on Tom's projections. But I mean, I always think of big company. Big great ideas go to big companies to die, um, and certainly not at Thomson Reuters. I would never say that. <laughs> um, no, but but seriously, I mean, how do you how do you keep fostering innovation, creativity? Um, and when you have extraordinary, you know, you have shareholders, you have bureaucracies, you have uh, politics, all the, the, the wonderful things about uh, corporate life. Uh, Peter, I mean, how do, you, how do you manage that at a place like Microsoft? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, under, I hear the meme. I lo I'm grounded enough to know uh, about all that. Um, but I have to say, you know, I started most of my career as an academic, Carnegie Mellon, and then went to DARPA and now to Microsoft. And... Uh, you know, the view at least in Microsoft Research, and I believe it's the same at other great industrial tech labs, research labs, is actually they are amazing engines for tech transfer. Now, I think it's then just a matter of scope and ambition level and visibility. You know, if I think about how often research ideas, let's say out of the Microsoft Research Labs, make their way into products, I would say it's, uh, conservatively, uh, four to eight times more successful there than what I was uh, witnessing at DARPA or out of an academic environment. And maybe there's a hint there that it gets too easy, that people are a little bit too close. There are too many low-hanging fruit kinds of problems in a company to kind of go after. And so one of the things that you try to do, I think, is to create some separation and some sense of uh, us versus them, you know, that, you know, a sense that we can do it better, that we can kind of create some discomfort. And if you try to have that kind of culture of, you know, who can we disrupt, even in the colleagues next to us, um, it, it seems to work a little better. And maybe that's one of the fundamental lessons I learned in my time at DARPA. DARPA was actively kind of promoting a culture of let's cause some pain, let's cause some angst for the operators in the military. Um, sometimes it put itself in extreme danger. You know, it's not comfortable when you have a program to build UAVs, and then the Air Force comes down and tries to go to Congress and cancel all the funding. <laughs> um, but there's a hint there that that is sort of an ingredient, that discomfort in creating innovation. And when I look at my role in Microsoft Research, it's something that I view as the most important thing that I do, to try to create a spirit that makes people unafraid to kind of poke people in the ribs. And I mean, does it help having uh, a, a financial incentive, do you think? I mean, is that or the, an incentive that, that, that you may not have in academia? I mean, maybe, Annalyn, you I, I actually, yeah. what he's describing is very familiar to me within the university. Berkeley is a, a, a big university. One of it's the, a for-profit school, right? Yeah, oh, of course. <laughs> We're rolling in dough, too. Um, it, one of the things I think, if I try to think about what distinguishes it, there's a lot of competition for ideas. It's not that we don't collaborate also and that we don't learn from one another and from our graduate students, but you know, there are a lot of people racing to do something. You know, right now, the big data, everybody on the campus wants to be in data, they want to be innovating, and so you see the astronomers competing with the physicists competing with the biologists, and so there is a, 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 a what, what um, 
you just said about Microsoft, rings, the research lab rings true on the university campus. It people aren't as financially motivated as they are. I want to be the first to do something. I want to disrupt. I want to, yeah. there's a lot. Well, I'm going to jump in on the Berkeley. I love the Berkeley yeah. story. Um, yeah. There is a lot of innovation coming out of Berkeley. And we actually consider it as part of our research team. Yeah. So we, as a company, stay very close to Berkeley in this AMP lab and some of the folks here. Uh, and there has been three spawned out companies yeah. that we have embraced and endorsed into our ecosystem yeah. because if they grow, it's growing our business. And so you can, as a company, you can start thinking of the universities as research teams. You stay close to them. You don't need to own, we're in an open source space, so you don't need to own all the, the projects and the code. But if you're fostering an ecosystem that's built off of your core platform, then you're growing. This is such a key point because that interaction with university research, uh, from my perspective, it just magnifies by 2x or 3x what we're able to do. Keep in mind, Microsoft research is less than 1% of Microsoft. We're just a tiny little, my joke is that if we want to put a new button on a ribbon on, on Microsoft Office, uh, we have to stand up uh, a team bigger than Microsoft Research. Uh, it's really a small <laughs> thing. And so we get tremendous magnification by openly collaborating yeah. uh, and when necessary funding university research. And it's, it's really- But 1% of Microsoft is bigger than our whole company. <laughs> <laughs> about the same size. Yeah. 1% of us is probably bigger too. What is yeah, 1% of Microsoft. We have a research about organization, about 3,000 of us worldwide. I tell people we're in every content except Antarctica. Um, and uh, we don't have a problem with innovation. We probably have a problem with too much. Mm. So you have, um, you know, of the 3,000, probably a couple of thousand have PhDs, and they are just falling over each other with idea after idea after idea. And, you know, the challenge, I've been on both sides. I've been in the research organization and on the business side. And by the way, that's the only place I've been in my career, is to help people uh, incubate their ideas such that they are mature and interesting that we can use, but we, there is no problem with it, with innovation. We have, in some sense, it's sometimes a little too unconstrained. I mean, I mean wacky ideas in my inbox every morning. It's kind of fun, <laughs> yeah. actually. Right. And, and, and by the way, I, I want to agree, uh, the university thing is is huge, and it's the nice thing about, Peter would probably agree, a lot of the innovations bottoms up. You cannot tell people, go be innovate tomorrow. You wait for individuals to meet someone at a conference and to say, I think I want to work with you. And that, yeah, that's really how it happens. Well, can I just share on this? On, uh, I worked at IBM three times, and there, there, there is tremendous um, new products and new ideas in research. The hard part is building a business because you need to hire a sales force. You need to hire a marketing team. And generally, that's 12 to 18 months before you see revenue. And then you're, you get into these, that's the challenge is taking a good idea and building yeah. a business around it and, and getting it out. Um, and and it's, it's just hard to do in, in some big organizations. So Jeff, you should just be fair? hanging around these academic yes. institutions, finding the kids and the, yeah. the buddy Pouring PhDs money. with their ideas <laughs> who are eventually going to. So some, some, <clears throat> some do if you, if you um, have less Berkeley because it's kind of far for us from um, Sand Hill Road, but Stanford, you definitely. You I go to I go to Berkeley speak uh, I'll once a year. You. I will invite you. I would I would love to do that, but uh, at Stanford you have you have literally uh, 10, 20, 30 VCs crawling in yeah. the university in the labs and everything to try and find those talents to um, to fund. Uh, what's been sort of interesting? So we believe in the uh, innovators dilemma. So you need to free innovation out of context of large companies, you know, to really emerge with radical innovation. And so that's our job. We try and help people who have radical ideas by funding them at the very early stage. And I think there's, there's really two stages in venture capital. One is really risk capital, which is at the very early stage, we um, you know, back people when we don't know whether it's going to work. And most likely, it's not going to work. And that's what people sort of don't always appreciate is we know that 30%, 40% of any dollar we put out is just going to wipe out. And that's OK because we'll make all of our money on the most successful companies and the rest doesn't really sort of matter. So I was this investor in Fitbit six years ago and when I saw them, they, they had this really big piece of plastic and they said, well, we're gonna put this, um, 
this tracker on your belt, and it's going to be great. And you know, it was like literally that big. <laughs> I was like, hmm, that's kind of interesting. And then we'll connect it to, uh, to the internet, and you will have all your data sort of out there. And, and that will sort of allow people to be really motivated with real data about their exercise. And I thought it was completely crazy, but that if ever it worked, it could create really sort of an industry. And, and yes, the big piece of plastic became something that um, you know, uh, consumers sort of ended up buying and that created an entire sort of new industry. So I think that's what we do is we um, meet uh, sort of crazy, smart entrepreneurs who are extremely passionate. We look at the products, the services that they have in mind, and we believe that if ever the small probability that they succeed actually hits, then they will create you know, a, um, a radical sort of company and eventually something very, very... Um, I mean, just while we're on the venture capital question, I mean, it's sort of interesting, you know, last year we did this panel in New York and we had the head of innovation for Ford Motor. Like, the amount of capital that's required to come up with a new product at Ford is extraordinary, right? Yep. Or, and we had someone from, I think, L'Oreal, similar, similar issue. Now I look at, you know, and even when I founded a company, sold it to Reuters many years ago, and it cost a ton of money to like cr create what we, you know, to put these things together. They cost nothing now. Mm -hmm. I mean, with the, the increasing, like, you don't need as much capital anymore. So you must have to bring more to the, ta to the table as a venture capitalist today than you did when you started, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So it's, it's very true that the cost, the buyer to innovation has dropped dramatically where... I'm speaking in the tech space, obviously. Yeah, yeah, in the tech space. But what's fascinating is that there are so many sort of areas of industry where you would say, oh, it costs $100 million to actually build a new nuclear plant research or whatever. And if you look at the last batch of uh, Y Combinator, which is the most successful sort of incubator uh, in the US, they actually had a couple of teams actually doing research in, in nuclear. And they got, you know, sort of a traditional startup funding. So there are so many sort of new areas where you can innovate because the barrier to innovation has dropped. The, the dollar uh, barrier yeah. has, has dropped. is pretty fascinating. Uh, one of my investments, uh, and I answer your question, I'm not avoiding it, um, is sort of in, in brain hacking where it's a headband that sends microcurrent in your brain to actually increase the, effic the efficacy of your memory so that a 47-year-old like me can recover the memory as if, uh, you know, that I had when I was a 25-year-old. That's pretty crazy, and, you know, it works. So to your question, yes, we're bringing capital. It's, it's sort of the necessary devil, but there is so much money available now at every stage of the funding sort of uh, curve in Silicon Valley that the differentiation is how good you are at delivering value added to your entrepreneurs, whether it's through your connections, through you know, the network you've built with your companies and, and, and your portfolio, and how good you are at recruiting. And, and so it's really your track record at supporting the entrepreneurs that gets you in the deal. The fact that you want to invest, there's for every dollar that gets invested, there's five, 10, 20 other that is waiting on the sidelines. Is that why Berkeley is not a venture capital fund as well as a university? Um, we don't have any capital to invest, but, but I would say that you know, one of the things we do is we call something venture capital and then everything, there, there's a whole range of things around the world that get considered that. I would say that the venture capital, what he's describing, early stage, high risk venture capital is very unusual. And especially when it's connected to an ecosystem where they know the network and the value added that they provide is not just the dollars, it's the network that they provide, the network to all sorts of other resources in the ecosystem. I go around the world and people will say to me, oh, we have tons of venture capital. You know, I'm in Finland or I'm in China. And the truth is, usually it's later stage dumb capital. And so the phrase has become almost meaningless. The thing that is really distinctive about this ecosystem is that it generates a lot of capital and then it gets reinvested in a very smart way within a community that is very wise and has had decades now to learn about everything about scaling companies, about marketing, about what consumers want, what businesses want. So um, I want to underscore that even though we say VC, it's a very distinctive kind that he's describing. And, that, and you, have, you have a fair amount of late stage. In, yeah, well, they had to start with I'll, I'll share stage. an early stage yeah, story, not relative to Cloudera, but I helped uh, in the past couple of years two companies get started. And I really realized the, the support system that's yeah. here in the Valley. It's amazing. So these companies, you know, just getting incorporated Coming up with a stock is this plan. Data bricks and yes. Uh, okay. So yeah. Coming up with a stock plan is difficult. 
uh, coming up with offer letters for employees is, you know, how do you do that? You're a first time on, you don't know how to write an offer letter that doesn't get you in trouble. The legal firms here, the big legal firms, do that for free. They offer all these, have these templates and they give it to these startups for free to help them incorporate and to build companies and come up with stock plans. Because they know that when that company gets funded and then they're gonna hire their first law firm, that they've got the inside track. So there's, there's nowhere else where law firms are gonna do yeah. work for free. Yeah. But they do it right here and they're doing it for all these right. startups. And so right. that's kind of the, the, the ecosystem that's built here. It's really amazing. You know, just drawing a contrast now, getting back to a big company, um, I think one way to think about it is at the Series A level, uh, everything's easy. People are not distracted, and maybe um, the, this amazing kind of pace of invention and innovation that um, that I see and Michael apparently sees at IBM comes from the lack of distraction there. There's just a ruthless focus that people have to pursue their ideas. Then there's a big question: What happens when you want to get? to Series B, let's say, just to yeah. make that as an analogy. So, you know, next month, for example, Microsoft Research will finally finish the beta of its Skype Universal Translator. Well, there is a big difference between that as a laboratory development and then deploying it for 400 million active users in the world. And so now we have an analogous situation of having to find ways to work within the structure of the Skype business in order to make that leap service a hell of a lot of customers and, right. and make sure that, that, that so it it's lands. going to market this scaling, right. scaling it going yeah. to market and interesting scaling. I should talk um, so my title is VP of innovations for Watson group I tell people it's a, a job title and an aspiration um, what happened to us is kind of interesting um, so we we wrote a computer program based on you know 60 years of research and six years of 27 people in a room with the door closed to play and win at, at Jeopardy in 2011. That's true. And uh, something very interesting happened. Um, you know, the people who called us were oncologists who said, well, gee, this might be interesting to help me deal with cancer. We expected the standard IBM uh, customer banks, governments to call us, didn't happen. Well, it is now. Um, but what we decided to do, back to the Series B discussion, was to take all of the Watson folks and put them on the side. So we're actually run autonomously, completely vertically integrated. We're about the same size as you. And um, we make up the rules as we go. We're left pretty much alone. And it's, you know, run like hell. How fast can you guys fail, make a mistake, fix, try again? Probably 15 times since January, which is when, we're, when we started. So, you know, I, I guess I give, I give kudos to our, our CEO for saying I, I need to innovate at you know, startup speed, so I'm gonna foster that culture here. So it's the, the skunk works, which I, IBM absolutely. sort of pioneered with the PC too, right? Yeah. I mean, that it's was a really that, interesting the, model. Yeah, the PC was another one. They, they said, where can we send people yeah. that's far away? Oh, I know, Boca Raton. But Florida. <laughs> right. <So laughs> Is they, that real? That's yeah. absolutely That's true, that's absolutely true, and that made a big difference. Get them the out PC of Ormond. The company was, in, was created uh, down yeah. there. Yeah, no, that's huge. I thought that's just where mobsters went, but. <laughs> Well, actually, this raises raise another question, which I think we're worth discussing, which is the role of place, or you know, and this can also extend to the idea of innovation elsewhere. Yep. But I mean, here we are, Silicon Valley, obviously, is is a is a nexus for for all of this innovation. But I mean, you've chosen East Silicon Village, Alley. Silicon Valley, yep. yep. East Village, yep. basically of New York City to base Watson. Yep. Um, why, why there? Why, why, I mean, shouldn't you be you know, here in Silicon Valley? As we... You know, we talked about it. Um, we wanted a place where um, there was a strong innovative culture. The idea that you can walk to universities, to other companies you're going to collaborate with was really, really attractive. And head That's shops. Why... To be and I forgot about the head shops. <laughs> Thank I you. live in that neighborhood. Thank you for mentioning the head shops. <laughs> um, and we're seeing that actually, uh, 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 you know, there's a lot of startup act activity here in San Francisco. Uh, for the same reason, the notion of proximity uh, really, really, really matters quite a lot. So that's why we're there. But, you know, yeah. Oh, I, I think place is incredibly important. Uh, like IBM Research, we, we have a dozen labs in there. I guess the sun never sets on any of our labs. No, it's uh, sad. The, but the yeah. thing about it is the place, different 
cultures, we are still a divided world in many ways. You know, when I think about what's happening in China right now, it is just this massive number of early adopters just rising. And it is creating possibilities that, at least in this five-year period, really aren't possible anywhere else. And it affects deeply the kinds of thinking and the kinds of research that people do. So is, is basically well, Shanghai or something going to be, or Guangzhou, I don't know. Guangzhou, I guess, is the place. But what, is gonna, what is going to be so, so here's an example. Silicon Valley? So here's an example. Um, so we had a team of very basic foundational uh, language pro natural language processing researchers in our Beijing lab. And there's a, the Twitter of China, Weibo. And so they were just mining and learning how people interact on Weibo. Um, and so that's a fine thing to do. That's, and they can publish lots of papers. But n because you're in China and you realize you're living in this world of early adopters, what they do is they create a super AI-powered chatbot called Xiao Ice. And they unleash it. And within three days, there are over 10 million followers. I think it's something like over 50 million followers now. Each one of those followers is having, on average, over 1,100 interactions with Xiao Ice every month. And so now you start to deploy, say, deep learning powered image recognition. And so Xiao Ai figures out, oh, people are talking about flowers or plants or wildlife. I'll put up some images and say, hey, I don't know what kind of flower this is. Does anyone else know? And using NLP, it sort of figures out, oh, people seem pretty certain this is a wild rose. And suddenly we get more training data that completes a virtuous cycle to just make everything smarter. And it's the kind of thing that I don't think would be possible in any of our other labs around the world, so, only in China. So I, wanna, I, mean, I mean, I think that's a really great story. And I, I, people have, you know, because I wrote a book about Silicon Valley in the 90s, people always invite me to come and how can we create, create the next Silicon Valley? And what I tell them is, you don't actually want to try to start Silicon Valley de novo. You really don't. What you want to do is connect to the networks that exist already. So the places that have done well, places, they're connected to Microsoft Research, they're connected to a set of networks and people who know how to take the, the value that they're adding and then help scale it. And so you think about Taiwan did a really good job early on on innovating and manufacturing, and now they're the center of all those dive devices you use are made mm. by Taiwanese firms, maybe in China. But Taiwan and Silicon Valley grew up together, and it was a connection that was very powerful. Israel has become very successful, and it's the same thing. They are innovating with venture capital, who goes back and forth, and they, they get in, how do you get into the value chain, the global value chain for innovation? It's by connecting in some way. Every place that has emerged around the world now that looks like an innovation hotspot, I would argue, um, has some connection. They're differently specialized. So the value that's coming out of India and places in India is very different than what's coming out of China because they're building on their domestic capabilities and they're building ecosystems there that wouldn't thrive on their own, but once they're linked to the knowledge and the networks and the know-how here, we they, share, they, they, they about flourish. Europe. Yeah, there's a good question. I'll share a little thought yeah. just in Europe. We, we're doing an exercise uh, at Cloudera. Yeah. <clears throat> so we're, we're the innovators behind this open source project called Hadoop. Um, but because it's an open source project, we're not the only contributors. Predominantly, we felt we had to find all our engineers here in the valley, and it's getting harder and harder to find these engineers. So we said, let's look at the Hadoop community, and we can actually see the pockets of around the world who's contributing to the code and where they're at. And there, there are some individuals, but they actually clump together because like people hang out and they get ideas from one another. So we're actually finding great spots in Eastern Europe. We're like going, wow, there's 20 people over there exactly. that are really smart, and there's certain parts in India then we're like, we're mapping it and we do uh, global education and training. Like, well, where are people are going for training? And we're starting to see these pockets emerging exactly. and that's what we're using for exactly. analysis going, where are we gonna put our overseas campuses? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and we're just using our own project to find out where the best uh, developers are. We, and, um, we opened a lab about a year ago in Nairobi. And uh, it's been an interesting experience. And, and along with place comes, I feel like, focus or, uh, and, you know, we asked, um, we opened up the lab because we said, you know, it'd be interesting to get into Africa. And, you know, Nairobi's, a, from an IT point of view, relatively mature there. And we, what do you guys want to work on? Um, and uh, we said, they said, 
we want to work on the grand challenge problems in Africa. Uh, there's a bunch, infrastructure being at the top of the list, long list of issues. And it was like, okay. So the ability that we have to attract people from all over the world to go sit in a, but it's a beautiful campus, it's on the university campus in Nairobi, to work on incredibly hard problems to your comment about wacky ideas. It's, it's like, I want to be there. So there isn't just place, to your point. It's there people. is ideas and people. Yeah. And what, what, let's let, let just a uh, slight pivot to policy, because I mean, you mentioned the 35 hour, 30 hour work, five hour work week. Um, and I mean, how will we have a new Congress? So what would you tell them to do, or I should probably more likely not do, <laughs> to foster innovation? I mean, what, 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 what's, what are they going to do? What should they do? So I think more for visas. us, yeah, more yeah, immigration like, reform. Entre entrepreneurs, <laughs> entrepreneurs' visa, more visas, so that we can actually draw. Because what we didn't discuss is Europe, and Europe yeah. has a ton of awesome sort of engineers and mathematicians or whatever. The problem is, you know, they need sort of the marketing machines that typically are in the U.S. You know, to succeed, and that's why it's so hard. And they don't have the capital available as well. But there is definitely interest for a lot of these people to sort of move here and join. The um, you know the Silicon Valley dream. We just don't have the freaking visas to actually do that, and we've been working on the entrepreneurs' visa for four years now. Unfortunately, even though everyone agrees it's a good idea, it's still stuck. Yeah, I mean, look at the Silicon Valley. One of the things that happened around 1990 is they Silicon Valley firms ran out of domestic engineers, and they ended up hiring these immigrants who had come to graduate school in the U.S. So by by you know 2000, half more than half of the engineers in Silicon Valley were foreign born, mm. and by putting a cap on the number of visas, we are just slowing down the growth of this ecosystem that could continue to grow very healthily. Now the other side of that is that it's very expensive, and so everybody is looking for cheap right. skills. So so. Eastern Europe, India, China, the reason these new pockets grow is because you can get cheaper labor there. And once they start growing, they develop their own special capabilities and then they become centers on their, of their own right. Yeah. So it, it's a really interesting dynamic. I think it's, it's price, but it's also liquidity, meaning you, you have you know, resources available that you can yeah. find there and you can get to work on an outsourced basis right. and so on and so forth. Because as you said, we, we just lack, you know, tens of thousands of engineers yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, this all makes sense, and the Microsoft is, uh, testified before Congress uh, about two years ago yeah. uh, with a plan for companies to actually fund uh, more uh, uh, visas. But maybe just to take a different tack on this, uh, thinking about the question, which is actually a hard one. The um, policy, yeah. One thing that would be wonderful to see happen is to see the full weight and full force of the government uh, behind motivating and incentivizing more girls and women to get into tech. And um, if you just think about the talent pool, you know, there's just some, just a huge part of the smart people in our country that just are inaccessible to us. And um, Amen, amen. And I would also say refund NSF. I mean, we have, I've been on an NSF advisory board and NSF has been, gradually the budgets have been sort of decreased, including, by the way, I'm a social scientist, and we get very little funding, and I actually think social science is as important. It's not that tech isn't important, but in order to get tech out and for tech to succeed in solving some of the big problems of climate change or whatever, we need social scientists as well, and we've starved the National Science Foundation. I was going to say something different about funding uh, related. Um, the fact that there's a new Congress shouldn't make a difference. So. I always tell uh, people when they say, how do I become an innovator? And I said, well, you've got to start with longevity of focus. Right? You've got to understand something before you can innovate. So I say the same thing about what's going on in, in Washington. Right? Longevity of focus. There's a new Congress. Let DARPA keep doing what it's doing. Let NSF keep doing what it's doing. Because disruption just is, is a horrible monkey wrench in this whole of innovation engine that we're talking about. And one last yeah. government related thing. I would, I would suggest our, our biggest issue for the next 10 to 20 years is going to be privacy. And I really think we need governments around the world. This is a geopolitical issue. It is a personal issue. It is um, a security issue. Uh, and I think we have to have a global effort and global organizations bringing consistency to privacy and what privacy means. 
Uh, and um, there's so many benefits to us sharing our data about ourselves. You know, the Fitbits mm -hmm. and the heart rate monitors for health reasons, uh, our cars, you know, um, there's so much benefits, yet there's so much uh, slippery slope around privacy. Yep. You know, and I think we need yeah. to really have a government, our, our government has to take the lead, but working with other nations around, you know, privacy regulations and controls. Yeah, I mean, this whole, what I would call cyber security, but it really does include privacy and security, uh, is a global thing. It's very hard for any single nation to address it alone. And, and yet, as, you know, as we have sensors everywhere, this is gonna become an incredibly important issue. And I worry that in Europe, the conversation is going down a very conservative pathway, and it's right. really constraining the use of data. And, and I think we need to step up and have a different voice I think that the challenge that um, policies have is as the rate of innovation and the velocity of innovation sort of increases, there is sort of this gap uh, which sort of is growing every day. If you look at uh, the challenge of commercial drones where the FAA has said, no way, well, it has to be sort of different. They have to come up with a more sort of comprehensive and smart sort of approach to drones because it's going to happen. And, you know, they will get there eventually, but they won't, they won't foster it, they won't support it, they will sort of back into it. Um, same thing, you know, the, all the issues that uh, Uber and Lyft and all the uh, shared, shared economy sort of startups have faced in terms of regulations, it's always like, let's go and sue and challenge and let's listen to um, the policy makers and then force them to uh, understand the, the um, you know, the situation that has been created. So, and the reason why is Congress and the House just don't understand technology and their, its impact. Yeah, technology's really outpaced our regulatory infrastructure, you know, yeah, system. Yeah, yeah. And, and technology, and, social, I mean, everything. Yeah, everything, it's not yeah. only sort of tech. Yeah. No, so I suppose yeah. recognizing that is the first step. Yeah, and then, yeah, and bringing in people who understand technology because it, it's So great. you all volunteer to do a couple years in the sure. administration. That's good to hear. Um, <laughs> they do keep asking. <laughs> and they show up in Silicon Valley asking for volunteers. Yeah. yeah. So ask and the, ask I, I served. Yeah, you, yeah, did, you, did. you did. You were at DARPA. Well, ask how many here were born in the United States. Uh -huh. No, you asked. Yeah. <laughs> you just asked. Yeah, I know. I was. You're Canadian. I'm Canadian. Uh, French. French. Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> San Francisco. Concord, Massachusetts. Well, that <laughs> California and Massachusetts may not qualify. <laughs> just to be no, Ohio, Ohio, you are Ohio, the only Ohio, American. Ohio, definitely. You're hardcore. <laughs> the the Republic of Berkeley. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, let me. Uh, well, the good news is we have Megan Smith now as the CTO of the United States, and so she'll do a good job. Good. Yeah, so. but in one person isn't enough. No, but, but she's a pretty powerful person. She's a very powerful <laughs> person, and she knows a lot of. I mean, she knows a lot of us. That's the point. She can draw, and she she's can well say, "Hey, connected. yeah." yeah okay. So, um, what are, what's the coolest thing that you are working on, or your team is working on, or you, you know, you you see in your environment that, or uh, slash the other side of the question is, is there something that you see, maybe you're not working on, that is actually going to be, we should be focused on it as a, for either great force for prosperity. Um, or disruption? That's my like prediction question. Phrased poorly. Wow, you yes, know, it's, what I said. it's such a hard uh, question. So uh, I, I have an answer, but let me preface, preface it by saying, throughout my career, I've had been so lucky to be at ground zero several times when the next big thing happened, and I never realized it <laughs> for years later. Huh. So it's. It's a Just, common, common. I, I was one of 241 subscribers in 1991 uh, on Altered Hypertext, who saw Tim Berners-Lee's uh, you know, announcement of this World Wide Web project, and I kind of shrugged it off. It, it, that kind of thing happened. That's like being a founding member of Pearl Jam and not knowing it. Uh, right. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> I mean, it, so, um, so having said that, what is top of mind for me and what I'm both excited and terrorized by is, um, uh, is next month we will have our beta launch of the universal speech-to-speech trans -speech translator for Skype. Can you explain what does that do? What is the problem it solves? So, um, so Skype for me and others in our research lab is a symbol of, it's a symbol. It's a symbol of democratized access to global telecommunications. It's a connector for free for anyone who can get access to the internet. And so the dream is to turn that into a portal that eliminates language barrier. Oh, so I could speak to somebody who speaks Mandarin and I speak in English. That's and right. We can communicate. And so uh, this is something we've been working on very hard. And um, we got ambushed by our new uh, 
uh, CEO, Satya Nadella. He demonstrated uh, the lab prototype that we had last May uh, here in the Silicon Valley at the Code Conference. And on stage, surprised us all by saying that we would deliver the beta by the end of this calendar year. Ouch. Ouch. We are on track to do that. Um, In how many languages? So we'll start very <coughs> conservatively um, uh, with, uh, with <coughs> care uh, next month. But then as the year goes on, more and more languages will. Uh, US roll English up. to UK English. Yeah, Armenian to yeah. Um, um, <laughs> Esperanto to. Um, but, um, and, you know, the thing that I think is special about it for us is it's not driven, first and foremost, by any profit motive or any, um, by any revenue model. I'm sh sure that the Skype uh, business guys will find a way to make money from it, but it really comes from a dream about where we can go with very, very massive scale machine. But that is an enterprise application for what is, for Skype, in a sense, that we're, which has been a... Yeah, if you look at what Skype users are doing today, most of them are speaking in their native tongue with people. Yeah, uh, like I in their my tongue. kids. Or, so it's a know. different use case, for sure. Um, so it's not too hard to imagine that. But from the perspective of what we're doing in Microsoft Research, it is something that is more attached to a, a dream about the way the world could How's the new boss? Uh, he's pretty amazing. He's cool. Yeah, he's like great. He's cool. Um, he um, he gets us in Microsoft Research to do new things without telling us to do anything new, and so it's just pretty clever. Like Jedi mind. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. What 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 about at uh, Watson? Wow. All right. So I'm going to name two things. So one of the previous lives I had at uh, at IBM. This will be quick, and then I'll talk about Watson was I got to, was very lucky to, to be the director of our Almaden lab in San Jose. That's the place where the relational database and the disk drive come from, so it's got some history. And um, there's a lot of cool projects there. I'm gonna offend all but one small team, and mention one. There's a team there that has been working away on lithium air batteries. And what's interesting about lithium air batteries? Well, they have the energy density of gasoline. Don't have to say any more, and they're not explosive, unlike other kinds of lithium batteries. So this um, will come, maybe it'll be us, maybe it'll be somebody else. It'll be transformational, completely transformational. So that's one. On Watson, the, the coolest thing, well, so this is the coolest job I've ever had. Um, we're trying to sort of create uh, models around sort of a um, next generation of, of computing. One of the patterns that we've been spending a lot of time on is what we call discovery. So the, uh, the symbiosis of a, of a subject matter expert and a computing system that's absorbed 35 or 40 million documents together is probably the coolest thing I've ever seen, a computer that's acting like a research associate, a useful one to help people discover new stuff. I mean, it just, you know, that's a dream we've had in computing for a very long time. Mm -hmm. We're beginning to see the, the glimmers of it. I won't bore anybody with stories. Um, but, you know, we have sort of demonstrated um, this pairing being powerful enough to literally discover new things at an incredibly rapid pace. That's cool. So, wait, I got a question on, on Watson. How do you keep Watson from becoming like Hal in space. I, whenever people add, so that's like, how question. do you know robots? Like, you're the guy, right. just everyone knows when the robots take over, <laughs> Michael is right. to blame. Right. So what I always tell people, whenever I, I always get this question, um, and it was question number two, I gave a talk in Singapore a couple of weeks ago, and it was usually question one or two. You're evil, you're gonna take all over, over the world when all these computers come together, and I always say, go talk to the phone company. And that's, that's about it. Why? What, what, what? No, I don't get that. So oh, I'm sorry. So the... Uh, <laughs> I'm dense. Just to Okay. Um, no one got it, so thank you. I, 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 I didn't get it either. So, so you, know, uh, you know, Watson's a bunch... There isn't one. There's a bunch of, you know, independent uh, computers, which are very, very good at um, uh, separating the signal from the noise in various kinds of unstructured information. That's what Watson does very well, which is sort of fairly different from an enormous collection of uh, computers coming together to uh, be evil. Right. So the, uh, I always tell people, the, uh, if you look in most of the uh, apocryphal 
movies. Um, and someone pointed out one uh, that came out in the 70s, Colossus, the uh, Foreman Project, I think was the first. Scary movie, by the way. What's it called? Colossus, the Foreman Project, was done in the 70s. And uh, the two sources of evil are either the phone company or, sorry, Peter, the Department of Defense. <laughs> so not us. Interesting. Skynet. 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 Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I, I'd love to share some, some things I think are pretty cool. Uh, our company, we do nothing cool or exciting, uh, but our customers are doing some amazing things. Um, we just are working with Children's Hospital of Atlanta, uh, one of the pr premier in the Southeast hospitals for ill babies and premature babies. Uh, so these babies are in these rooms, they're fully censored. Down the hall, there are nurses, but it's a very reactive system. Uh, basically, an alert goes off, the nurses call the doctors, they rush down and they take care of a baby. What they realized is all that data was going away. So we started collecting the data. And then we actually collected data from the lights. Are the lights on and how bright are they? The temperature of the room. We started tracking the door opening and there was a camera of how many people are in the room. And we've taken all that data and now they're proactively changing how these babies are taken care of. And the recovery rate has dramatically improved. That's great. It's a tremendous story. Uh, we've done a project with Intel, uh, Michael J. Fox Foundation, around Parkinson's disease. So studies around Parkinson's disease has involved taking patients, and they come in every three months, and they're interviewed by a doctor. And the doctor asks questions, and then they're trying to trend and map, you know, what's causing Parkinson, what have you. What we've done with Intel is they're now wearing a device. It's probably like your first Fitbit device. It's not too good, but it's a device that's, we're now tracking uh, thousands of Parkinson's patients and likely Parkinson's patients, and we're getting data every single minute. And it's just changing the analysis there. Um, we're working with an insurance, an auto insurance company in Italy, where they actually, they've got a device that uh, is a sensor on cars. It plugs into the onboard computer on cars, streaming all that data in. They can actually tell if their customer does rolling stops through a stop sign. That's the granularity. And so now they're coming up with new insurance programs. Not are you a good driver, you haven't had a ticket in 10 years. No, are you a good driver? And, um, and these are all just really exciting things. And now I know I asked about privacy. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah I want to, I want to, I <laughs> You know, I think. You were going to make Italy safe for drivers? <laughs> well, it's coming <laughs> here. It's coming here. Awesome. So, so all the insurance companies are rethinking auto insurance along, you know, our Use actual driving basic. habits. Because cars, all the automakers are instrumenting their cars. So, and they're doing it for their engineering purposes and for service reasons. But now they're going to start making that available to insurance companies. Um, health insurance companies are doing the same. They're now experimenting with the Fitbits, mm -hmm. heart rate monitors. I'm a diabetic. Uh, I have continuous monitoring of my blood glucose. Eventually, I'll be making that available to uh, my insurance provider to say I'm a good diabetic. Um, these are really exciting things. I think are going to change all of our lives. On a voluntary all, basis. On a voluntary basis. Okay, so I have to be a voice of caution amidst all this techno-optimism, because the technology is cool. It's very cool. But we do have to think about the social issues. And I think there are a couple issues that I think we worry about at the university. One is, where is the employment going to be in the future? Right. And we need to really think carefully. I'm not saying there won't be jobs, but there are a lot of jobs that are going to be replaced by artificial intelligence, by Watson type things. I heard Ginny Romady is going to be replaced by Watson. Is that true? <laughs> that's probably a rumor doesn't that's going think around. That would be. <laughs> you know, we, uh, it's, it, it, uh, it's a good point. One of our researchers, Jaron Lanier, uh, published a yeah. book recently, Who Owns the Future? And with, relative to the Skype translator, he points out in the book that, um, that we are putting translators out, out of, of business by mining all of the work that human translators have done mm -hmm. over, the, over the past decades. And we yeah, have the, the capacity to do that. And there are many jobs that will be eliminated yeah. by What's this the only tech? jobs that will create when you bring well, you know, different cultures together? I, I, I guess I want to just say that, that That's a good point. there are some real issues about how we're training our young people and what the jobs will be. And I, I suspect that the jobs that will be, remain will be the creative ones or the ones that are human serving, where people are working. We may not be training our students to, for those jobs, and I think we need to work, think really carefully about the next couple of well, generations. I'd give the, the one that I'd be worried about is the university itself. 
the concept, I mean, education and, I, I mean, seems to be one of those things that I, well, you know, I look at. Well, the I, university is under immense stress, yeah. immense stress. I don't think that's all bad, by the way. I think there are good things that can come out of that yeah. and innovative things. The other thing I do want to mention just in terms of is come back to the privacy and the, the ethical issues that come up when you are having sensors that are in your car, that are in your house, that are watching your everything about your health. Who gets access to them? How do they use it? This is all completely uncharted terrain. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we need some real serious minds to think about that if we don't really run into trouble. We don't want to. I, uh, I did want to say something else that another positive, though, um, yeah. that's not business related as much as it is about the human condition, because the same technologies that you're talking about, and I think this is going to be a big wave over the next three to five years, is the deployment of technologies that really allow people to overcome whatever physical mm -hmm. limitations. Yes. Yep. or incompetencies that they Which might have. Huge. And all of the ideas that you expressed you know, can just all also be applied in wonderful yeah. ways. And no, and these are absolutely great things. I can't, I can't say that those aren't great things. I, I mean, I- But it is a slippery slope of privacy. There, yeah, there's a set is. of issues, and I'm, I'm running a data science online degree, and we're trying to think about, okay, what are the capstone projects these students are gonna do? And every time we come near a data set, we have to stop and say, well, what will the, you know, the Committee for the Protection of Human Subjects say? And what are the privacy issues? And so it's, there's always a dance, and it's a really complicated well, then dance. Then there's a whole open data initiative, which is you know, data should be open and available, right. which then uh, you know, you're like, well, what data? And then you're starting to find what data should be open and not copyrighted. Yeah. I, I just think there, there's so many of these social institutional issues that we need to deal with, that we need real careful thought about. And I want to get the minds, the great minds that are here and you know, around us to also start focusing on those, those Amen. issues. Amen. Jeff, like what's the one yeah. given investment that you think is you know, really cool, innovative? Well, uh, so, the, or the one that you, that's not yours necessarily that you wish you the best. Well, that was for me. Um, no, I think the the general theme, which I find uh, really sort of fascinating, is bringing together the physical world and you know the connected world. So we see so many interesting uh, connected devices that you would never sort of expect. Um, example: I haven't funded them, but the other day I had uh, a pitch around a. Um, a connected grill, which was full of sensors that was bringing, you know, based on what you were cooking, were bringing like a steak to the perfect temperature and was sort of modulating temperature so it's cooked perfectly and it would stop on its own if you wanted medium, if I want, I want it sort of uh, rare, it would stop exactly where you wanted it. And it's all sort of because of steakhouse. Sensors. <laughs> well, but you can do it at home, and you don't you don't need to watch it. Putting the steakhouses so, out of business. But that's that's yeah. There's another set no, of jobs. Because, <laughs> yeah. So but yeah, but you, you will know, create other, and you know, you can have a cook at your home as well. See, but, but when, the point the, when the apocalypse comes, people will not know how, know how to cook the antelope that they've. <laughs> so I mean, it is it is, is it is true that through the history of innovation, jobs disappear, new jobs appear, right? Yeah. Um, when I was in graduate school, people were writing operating systems. They don't do that anymore. Yeah. They innovate on right. top of them. Uh, no buggy whips. But there's no typewriter anymore. It is possible, however, <laughs> that this is a different. I mean, I, I know that line. The economists always bring out the line. I know. Uh, the jobs have been eliminated throughout history, and we've always regenerated. There are. There is possible that there are new. Well, it was things. 300 years ago that the Luddites, I think. Yes. Were threw up, so tore apart those machines. The, the invention of the loom yeah. really yeah. put them out of business. Yeah. But I think that the I think that the um, the notion of having sensors, 3D printing. Uh, will really sort of revolutionize the way sort of things are, are done. You don't longer have a buyer to uh, tooling something, you can just 3D print it. And that will sort of create a radical set of innovations in terms of new devices that will potentially change the, the life of people who have, you know, a certain sort of disease and so on and so forth. So uh, that's I mean, look at systems are going to be optimized. You can make systems much more efficient than they ever were before. Mm -hmm. These big, I'm talking about big transportation systems or airlines or whatever. By, by having sensors, you can actually track and then make them much more efficient. Yeah. That's great. They will but be just, cheaper. I want to go back and the privacy thing and this thing. Yeah, I was, I was saying, this stuff, the privacy, our, a lot of our data is already out there. So how many of you have gone to a friend's house and looked up the value of their house before you went there? Right? <laughs> I don't do that kind of thing. Many of us have, right? <laughs> you, you know, 10 years ago, you had to go down to the courts and ask for the papers, right? This is tacky. But it's, it's all out there, right? You know what their mortgage is, that data's out there. Um, I, this is tacky. I don't think everyone is as creepy as you. Yeah, this is really creepy. <laughs> I, I'm sitting way too close to this guy. <laughs> well, I was thinking, I was going to say he was the business guy. I would tell you, um, 
Uh, last year, I um, bought a Tesla, and uh, it was three weeks before PG&E sent me a notice that they recognized I had bought an electric car. Okay, my electric company knew that I bought an electric car. And, and, no, who would they sell that data to? That knows I have an electric car, but they have a smart meter. They knew that I was drawing 240 volts, you know, every night in these hours. What else could it be? I'm not doing laundry all night, so it's. Um, it, it, our, our privacy is getting out there. And it kind of comes back to, you know, you want to put these controls in place. Let's open this up to questions, should anybody have them. And my question is for Peter, and I saw Peter just before the panel, and I warned Peter that I wanted to ask him a question about the closing of the Silicon Valley campus of Microsoft. <laughs> um, the, the community is outraged about yeah. two things. A, what happened, and B, how it was handled. So what happened was that basically the lab was closed down, a few people, and almost everyone was fired, a few people, some Turing Award winners and a few others were not fired, but almost everyone was fired in a mass firing in the auditorium. Um, so, so first of all, as for what happened, the reason there's so much unhappiness in the community is that uh, Jack Welch of GE famously said, fire the bottom 10% of your workforce every year. If you fired low rank people who were doing poorly, people would have been sympathetic. But instead, the Microsoft Silicon Valley campus had a lot of great people, people, outstanding people, young, many of them young, who done fabulous work. And the community is very puzzled. Why would you fire those people? Why wouldn't you find is that Poor your question? Performers. Is that your question? That's part one. Part one is why. I know a lot of people have questions, so let's. Okay. Get right part to two it. is how it was handled. A mass firing in the auditorium, which to many people consider that insensitive. So I'd like your reaction to both part one and part two. Yeah. Um, so uh, and you know, let me first thank you for asking the question, it, because underlying the question is an obvious amount of. Um, care and concern about what we do and who we are in Microsoft Research. And I believe me, I'm uh, keenly aware, and everyone in Microsoft is keenly aware of the special place that Microsoft Research has. Uh, I think it's not going too far to claim that Microsoft Research is actually a symbol and an argument for researchers everywhere yeah. for why research matters. And, and I think that the reaction um, that you're expressing that we've heard from many people and which we knew would happen um, is just an expression of, uh, it comes from that place. And so um, I'm honestly, and all of us at Microsoft Research are touched um, by those expressions of concern and in some cases of outrage. Um, so first of all, um, uh, we have a new CEO and the new CEO is making a lot of very bold moves. Um, and one of those bold moves is a reshaping of the company that has involved is part of the plan uh, laying off 18,000 people this year. And the way that the company has approached that is to ask every single division in the company to participate in that. So there were targets there. Um, I completely reject the Jack Welch idea. I completely reject the idea of stack ranking. And in fact, the company tried stack ranking for two years and we rejected it. It was, it's just, a terrible thing and is especially terrible for a creative organization. Um, and so we don't do that. And personally, I was completely unwilling to try to go through what I believe would be the worst kind of stack ranking exercise, which is to try to identify the bottom end percent. Absolutely not. Nothing I think could be worse. And so we proceeded along the lines of trying to minimize the number of people affected and the impact on who we are, and we tried to isolate uh, our actions on a single geographical location. And in that whole process, it was very difficult. We ended up settling on the 50 people in the Silicon Valley. And it was really very, very painful. Having said that, we are now in a position of being absolutely central in Microsoft. We are in a position of a CEO that now has so much credibility with the board and the shareholder community. I mean, he's gotten the stock from 27 to 47. You are going to see some amazing growth and amazing things come out of Microsoft Research and Microsoft Engineering. I'm pretty excited about it. And on top of all of that, of the 
nearly 18,000 people who have been laid off this year to date in this plan by our CEO, the only 50 people that are being discussed by the board and by our CEO are the 50 people from Microsoft Research Silicon Valley. Nothing has done more to reestablish the central importance of research in the mindset of Microsoft <coughs> leadership uh, than this. And so I'm, I'm deeply sad and I wake up sometimes with some grief uh, uh, over this. There were men long time mentors from back when I was an assistant professor, um, but we are in an exceptionally strong position right now. I think we're really on a roll and I, I hope that we will have a chance to come back to Silicon Valley in a big way and rebuild. Other questions? We heard earlier the mention of the, uh, how big companies and even small companies uh, collaborate with universities. And we talked a lot about innovation. So I would like to know, Annalie, what you see in terms of how Berkeley and other universities can innovate. And we have seen some interesting developments around MOOCs, online learning, and so on. And uh, I think uh, some of those are interesting. But do you see uh, some more fundamental transformation in uh, our universities and how they can play a bigger role in, in working with uh, industry in the future? Um, and maybe online learning uh, enabling more global collaboration mm -hmm. uh, as a result. And, uh, uh, do you see interesting platforms being developed to enable that kind of collaboration between Berkeley and... I come from the Nordic region and I see Norwegian, Swedish, Danish academics coming here all the time yeah. wanting to collaborate more and so uh, I think there are yeah. tremendous opportunities here. But I would love to hear how you see it and yeah. what is happening at Berkeley particularly. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, I, I can take this moment to tout one of the most important uh, initiatives coming out of Berkeley at the moment, which is um, called the Global University. And essentially, Berkeley has, most universities, or many universities now, have campuses you know, in Abu Dhabi or in Singapore or whatever. And Berkeley has decided we'd rather build our global network in the Bay Area. We have a big piece of land in Richmond, California. It's right north of us. It's a big, beautiful spot of land that we are now devoting to become a global campus. And we'd like to partner with big companies and with universities, international universities. And the chancellor has been going around the world to Asia, to Europe, part finding partners that could become partner universities. And we'd like to see students coming to Berkeley to become part of Berkeley. and. Um, sort of then send them back. So I, I think that essentially what we're doing is extending, the vision is to extend the way that Berkeley and Stanford and other universities have played in the local e ecosystem to make that now a more global network. Just the way I described it, Silicon Valley has itself developed global networks. I think the universities are developing global networks. I certainly think we're also innovating, by the way, in online education and, and many, many other areas. I mean, I think if you go into the AMP lab, the engineering labs, there's so much going on. I mean, always continually. Among our undergraduates, among our graduate students, there's tremendous innovation. And I think making it a global presence will just sort of fuel that. So as long I'm, as they can get the visas. Yeah, as long as they can get the visas. Yeah. Another question around innovation and business practices. I think it touches a little bit about what you're talking about, about uh, data, data ownership. But you can also see in biological sciences where you've had uh, patents um, issued over biological processes, over DNA, et cetera. In Silicon Valley especially, there's a lot of sort of closed uh, business practices. So there's an inherent tension between um, doing open innovation, open standards, open work, but closed business practices. And in some cases, these sort of closed business practices may be very good for stockholders, but not necessarily for you know the larger society. So is that something that, or it would be interesting to have some, some of you talk to that and uh, what you're currently thinking about that. Yeah, I'll do it. Pick that. We had a near-death experience um, soon after I joined IBM. Uh, we talked about breaking the company up. We ended up not doing it. And um, when we woke up, um, we really changed a lot of the model of, of innovation around software. So we are um, a huge contributor to, to open source. You know, Hadoop being a, 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 a recent <coughs> noble example, Cloud Foundry being another one, Linux. And um, 
we have found the right way to think about this is open source is a beautiful um, way to level the playing field and to, to provide sort of a, a good solid grounding to everybody, innovate on top. So uh, we do that, it's part of our DNA, we do it again and again and again. It's, and it's uh, a wonderfully democratic process. Some of us are contributors, some of us, you know, bring it back in and build products on top of it. Um, and the business processes aren't, aren't really closed at all. So it's really kind of understanding, and open data, as you talked about, was another one. It's, it's understanding the relative value of open and the relative value of, of, of open as substrate on which you innovate. And I'll just jump into this. So IBM is one of our largest competitors, yet is one of our greatest collaborators. And because it's an open source project, what we do is we're regularly on the phone talking about open source standards so that the broader community is uh, getting more aligned and writing towards more common standards. And then we differentiate or we compete on capabilities on top of that, that open core. Yeah. Um, and so Hadoop, which uh, we're the innovators behind, we wouldn't even be in business today were it not for open source. Um, you know, six years ago, if we had a proprietary distributed database that was in its infancy, no one would buy it from us, <laughs> right? No, no, one, no one would buy it from us. But the fact that it was an open source project that got community groundswell across the globe, and there's tens of thousands of developers working on this, and it's like becoming the most elegant yet complex code uh, is why it's here. And then, uh, but we all have to make businesses, right? I've got hundreds of engineers I have to fund, so I have proprietary unique software atop of it that we differentiate from our competitors. Uh, can, another question, this woman here. Hi, I just um, came back last week from the Washington Ideas Festival. And they were talking a lot about um, open data and their initiatives behind that. I'm actually really curious if, if that's touched any of you, if, any, if, if you've interacted, your companies have interacted, benefited from um, that initiative, and in what ways? Well, is this the, pub, the government open Correct. data? That, yeah. That's right, yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, yes. We, we're all very much deeply engaged in open data, and I think we're all very committed to it. I think the challenge is that, you know, making data open is one thing, making it sort of usable. Useful, useful, right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a mess. I mean, a lot of that data is a mess, and right. so, Right. Um, it, I think it's a work in progress, but I think it is a very important work in progress, just like open source software. Yeah, data.gov is one pretty <coughs> big table of contents. It's, it's um, truly frightening. Yeah. 97,000 or whatever the number of pages in the catalog yeah. is. Yeah. It's, so yeah. the challenge. Stored in Hadoop. There we go. Yeah, it's got a good, it's, I'm glad we can So the, cha it. the challenge, um, and you said it perfectly, yeah. is, is how to make that stuff things that uh, we, can, we can use to provide value. Yeah. Art. We've gotten very interested in Microsoft Research in providing more <clears throat> access to open data sets for research purposes. Um, it can be pretty challenging. You know, we were a founding funder of the ImageNet um, in the computer vision space, the ImageNet effort uh, at Stanford, which has really made a tremendous transformation in the basic research in computer vision. And, we're taking that to a new data set called COCO, and we're hoping to similarly mobilize the government and universities there. But ultimately, you know, there's so much proprietary data that um, I have started to wonder if we need to spread the risk a little bit and maybe have a consortium of companies form some type of research data institute or something that, to parallel what the government is doing um, on its open data initiatives. The idea being that there can be some controls um, that are similar to the controls that we have in other types of basic research, um, and that uh, no single entity, no single company would have uh, the complete say in how that goes. There is tremendous opportunity in basic research at universities if we could unlock access to the petabytes of, of uh, data that companies uh, produce every day. And, um, and I think it's something that at MSR we're very interested in helping to create, if, if at all possible. I think and one of the, well, as you share, just one of the issues in the whole open data is one of the, the guiding principle is if, if you're using data for free, you should give your derivative works back into the community. 
However, if you go through great lengths to clean the data, to organize the data, and to have algorithms to get insight out of right. the data, you know, to build charts and graphs, and you know, maybe you're grabbing free weather data and labor rates, and you come up with an algorithm which farms are going to produce or not, shouldn't you be able to copyright that and protect that? And that's, uh, that's one of the issues in the whole uh, open data. I mean, if you put a lot of work into it, can you protect it? Well, I, I, that's one of the big issues. And the other issues, you know, all of our students are interested in social data. And there's all the social media data out there. But nobody now, I mean, after that experience with Facebook, nobody is going to share their data. I mean, we're not going to get any of that data now. And, it, and for good, maybe, reasons, if they're personally identifiable. So there's a lot of issues that need to be resolved about data. I'm glad to hear that Microsoft is interested in a consortium. It seems like a good approach. We have time for one more question. Uh, the question I have is that uh, big data, you know, isn't, isn't that really about consciousness? Because we can suppress the concept that data is just data. But if we lift it and we look at what knowledge is there, then what sort of, you know, if we can look at the privacy issues with the panopticon side of it, or we can look at the, you know, the openness of getting to research. But at the end of the day, it's about the evolution of our consciousness. And so uh, I would, um, you know, ask the question of, you know, IBM on the Watson side of things, Microsoft with, uh, as they were looking at it, um, how are you approaching the evolution of consciousness? of man, and it's, how does man meet the machine is the question. Dude, you are today. getting heavy here. Yeah, this maybe. is really, I, I, yeah, yeah, I, I, I you might have to bring the cocktails out. out. Yeah, yeah, some cocktails. <laughs> maybe something else, but maybe someone could try to answer that. Let me, um, so I'm, I talked about discovery earlier. Let me put, put some uh, paper on the wall, tell you what the work was. So we, um, we did a piece of work with the Baylor College of Medicine. Um, the most studied gene on the planet is called P53, the cancer gene. There's 75,000 active publications on it. And we got interested in working with Baylor to say, and by the way, uh, the uh, chemical compounds that affect the way this gene works called kinases, they're discovered at one a year worldwide. Okay, so the opportunity cost of discovering a new one is huge. So um, this discovery activity that I talked about mined the 75,000 papers that had been written on P53 uh, since people first started writing on it. And um, they discovered uh, four, well, actually, they discovered six uh, potential uh, kinases uh, in a few weeks instead of one a year. Um, and two of them were known, four of them weren't. So I don't know if you want to call it consciousness, but the, the reason, the, the ability for computers not on their own, I don't believe in that, but as, as adjuncts to make us better people, that um, caused me to pause. It's another way of crowdsourcing, uh, too. You were yeah. talking earlier. Yeah. I'll give you something spooky along these lines. Um, uh, I'm sitting so, between two people. I don't like to <laughs> so the, um, um, So the speech models that we're training for uh, recognizing human speech uh, so they're neural net based. So we get thousands of hours of labeled uh, speech waveforms in English, and we throw these things at the neural net, and out pops uh, something that understands English speech pretty well. OK, great. And it has property that we feed more English speech, and it gets better and better. Now we take that neural net, and we throw thousands of hours of Mandarin at it. Well, the, the thing starts to understand Mandarin, but the English comprehension improves. Then we throw French at it. And the English and Mandarin improve. And so there's, there are these effects of um, what is technically referred to as transfer learning that are just, uh, you know, even the most kind of uh, skeptical person starts to think about what is going on uh, under the hood. Uh, That's uh, there. fascinating. And it's, um, it does make people think about, I don't know if I'd go so far as to talk about consciousness, but about the structure of learning, learning, right? And um, who knows? I think in something like Watson, for sure, discovery will be one thing. But I suspect that in the internal structure that Watson learns on its own, there are going to be more surprising things that, that yeah. come out at some point. Does it ever say to you, like Michael? 
<laughs> I'm very upset with your <laughs> choice of lunch <laughs> today. <laughs> that so, hurt. You're not allowed to ask questions. Why did you choose that salad? Uh, all right, I think we need to close it here. Thank you all. Thanks to our panelists.